You are listening to Geek Fest Rants on the IC Robots Radio Network. You have located Geek Fest Rants, the entertainment podcast for genre geeks like you. Shall we play a game? Covering the world of vintage and current film and television since 2010. Game over, man. Game over. Featuring in-depth conversations on sci-fi, horror, fantasy, comics, toys, and conventions. So say we all. So say we all. And now sit back, relax, and enjoy today's show. <laughs> Hey, we don't serve their kind here. What? You're droids. They'll have to wait outside. We don't want them here. Why don't you wait out by the speeder? We don't want any trouble. I heartily agree with you, sir. Where do you think you're going? Well, I'm not going that way. It's much too rocky. This way is much easier. What makes you think there are settlements over there? Don't get technical with me. What mission? What are you talking about? I've just about had enough of you. Go that way. You'll be malfunctioning within a day, you nearsighted scrap pile. And don't let me catch you following me, begging for help, because you won't get it. Oh, no. Oh, my God. Can you hear me? Say something. You can repair him, can't you? We'll get to work on him right away. You must repair him. Sir, if any of my circuits or gears will help, I'll gladly donate them. He'll be all right. Hi, everybody, and welcome once again to Geek Fest Rant. My name is Carlos Perron, and today I have Steve Folks joining me to discuss another Star Wars topic that we were thinking about, and that is... Are droids considered to be slaves in the world of Star Wars? We're going to approach this by trying to answer a couple of questions throughout the entire Star Wars franchise. Some of these questions will include, does slavery even exist in the Star Wars world? Are droids treated like slaves by their masters or owners or just random people, you know, completely inhabiting the world of Star Wars? And are droids or should droids be considered sentient beings, you know, based on the rules and based on the creative writing, you know, behind Star Wars? We will also examine a few other examples of films that have looked into the subject before, but we are going to try to focus primarily on Star Wars because that is where all these rules are being generated. So let's get started with today's show. What did I teach you? You are the Duke of New York. You are a number one. You will not laugh. You will not cry. You will learn by the numbers. I will teach you. Can you dig it? Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. That horn of Satan. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> the Force will be with you, always. Hey, Carl, how you doing? Okay, everybody, joining me once again, I have Steve here with me. Hi, Steve, how are you? Well, today we are going to tackle a subject that kind of came out of nowhere very recently. I forget exactly what it was. I was on Facebook and some of my crazy Star Wars toy collecting or podcasting or some kind of Star Wars group, and people are posting questions, you know, like um, conversation starters type of questions. You know, what, what would you think of this? And what would you th- And I was like... I started to think about that scene where in Star Wars, The New Hope, where the droids are walking into the cantina and the bartender is like, hey, you're droids, they can't come in here. And he looks like, what? And the little, like an alarm goes off on the wall. Blah, 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 blah. And they're like, you know, uh, they're, you know, they're not welcome here. You're droids, they have to wait outside. You know, that whole sequence. And Luke is like, yeah, okay, yeah, all, right, all right, all right. So he kind of hushes, hushes them over to this corner and says, all right, you guys wait outside. And everybody's kind of agreeable upon it. And that kind of, is something that I've always thought about, and it's kind of like, is there some meaning in that? In other words, is there some kind of, you know, second-class citizenship, if you will, you know, with droids? But even before we can even examine droids altogether, the first question I would ask is, in the Star Wars films, you know, 
because it is a fantasy. Now, that's another thing to keep in mind. Lucas specifically said, it's not really science fiction. You want science fiction, you go see 2001. You know, hardcore science fiction. Star Wars is more fantasy with a science fiction, you know, code over it. So the question is, is there such thing as slavery in Star Wars? Now, granted, I'm trying to approach this from the droid perspective. You know, are droids treated badly? Are droids ignored? That sort of thing. Uh, I did a show many, many years ago. I forget, even forget how long ago. And it was all about droids and the different type of droids. And we were like, got to a point, I remember with, with the co-host that I, that, that I was working with at the time, where we were like, but wait a minute. It sounds like these droids can do so much and are so almost sentient in a way because they're so personable and, and they express feelings and they express pain and this and that. You know, does that mean that they're slaves within this fantasy world that that we're dealing with and we never really went forward with it we kind of stopped there and said okay let's 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 stay on topic but let me ask you a question based on what we know so far of I all these films that is the concept of slavery something that exists positive, in star yes. wars i mean now it, we have to sort of realize the context that you know uh, in star wars you know they were obviously shot out of chronological order so so, but I mean, if we started at Phantom Menace, episode one, the whole, the whole idea of, of even right. human slavery is a real thing. So, you know, let alone we would bring into something like the idea exactly. of having, you know, um, droids or robots, if you will. So th that, I think it lends itself to, you know, the point of saying, yeah, you know, there's definitely, I mean, if, if they're saying in, the, in these outer rim planets and, you know, that aren't so close to the core, you know, capital planets that human slavery can exist then i definitely think at least a second class citizenship would be applied to uh, things like droids right right now the best example obviously is anakin skywalker in phantom menace we learned that He's a slave. He was bought and purchased, you know, along with his mother. Originally, I think by, they said by Gardula the Hutt, who then sold her to Watto or something, or he lost her in a bed or, or purchased or lost her or this or that or the other. So apparently this is happening, you know, in, in, in these outer core worlds. And they do mention it on the film. They kind of give you a little bit of an explanation. Now, when we get to Attack of the Clones, for example, and further, you know, even even in Revenge of the Sith, or even in the Clone Wars animated series, the clones, if you think about it, they're kind of slaves. They're pre-programmed humanoids that don't seem to have a choice in the matter of anything. They're bred to go to war, basically. That's that's the bottom bottom line for them. Right, so exactly. And, and that's and a the whole thing, other the, the thing the issue is that, having to do you know, with uh, a, a to form a of slavery, extent. right? I mean, I, I don't know if I would say it's worse than slavery, but I mean, they, they don't even have like the outside possibility of, you know, becoming something better or breaking away. I mean, they're, if you look at the canon material, the clones are basically, they're bred for war. They have like accelerated time, you know, growth. So, yes. So, so, I mean, they can't even hope to have like a normal life. Like once it's, the Clone Wars is over, the I mean, growth, what do you think yeah, happens yeah. to all those clones? I mean, you, they're not going to go off, you know, into a resort somewhere. They're pretty much, they're pretty much, I mean, we, we, you got to think about it, what would happen to all these clones that after the war is done, <laughs> you know, so, or, 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 you know, not even the specific war, you know, cloning in general. So the idea that, you know, droids and clones, and especially the fact that they're both, you know, on both opposing sides, like we see in um, Attack of the Clones, you know, the one army has the droids and the one army has the, has the clones. And they're both sort of two sides of the same coin, really. Uh, when you think about it, they're both using, you know, basically stand-ins for real soldiers. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. For, the, for their own people, right? They're surrogates. Well, the other thing about the clones is that, you know, I, I do remember there were a couple, not a lot, but a couple of clone episodes, Clone War episodes, where there's even a clone that's considered to be a, a deserter. And he's kind of living a life with a wife in another planet, and they kind of run into him, I remember. And it's about that whole thing. There's, well, what happens if a clone decides he doesn't want to fight a war anymore? He wants to just live a normal life. And even for the Republic, the good guys, it is considered right, yeah. to be and, and, and again, so that, that was a, a an interesting here, concept that's really to be in the mix. Clone Wars, the animated series, because if the movies were like the the overall meat and potatoes of the Star Wars story, the animated shows, and we we have you know like in the books and everything, they can really dive into those type of stories and tackle stuff like you know, which they didn't really do, but tackle stuff like slavery and and you know the side topics. Yeah. 
Now, the other thing we do also know, again, not necessarily from directly watching a movie, but from some of the EU material. Now, granted, I don't like to go crazy on EU because if you go so deep into EU, and I know there's the old EU that is not considered canon anymore, and I know there's the new EU that is considered canon, but... There has been a, a very long underlining uh, current here where it is kind of believed that the Empire likes to use non-humanoid creatures, let's say, for more of their dangerous, slavish kind of uh, practices, including Wookiees. You know, the whole thing about Wookiees being rounded up and being forced to work in, in labor camps and that whole thing. Clone Wars, the animated show, touched upon it at one point. There was like entire Wookiee tribes in prison, and I think Ahsoka freed some of them, or and I think she, she actually met Chewbacca at one point or something like that. And even in uh, Solo, you know, the, the mines of Kessel, they're being mined by a lot of not necessarily, I mean, it could, you could be, you could consider some of them prisoners, but some of them were like stolen people, slaves, basically. I slave labor. Surface. I have a so decent amount of books. Too. I, mean, I don't know how the deep older you ones go are more like the, the, the more current EU. But, but there is something actually really interesting that I did find on this topic. I look back at the original mm -hmm. Star Wars A New Hope um, novel, which is written by George Lucas himself. Yes, yes. And there's one line Correct. that Ghost sort written of by touched Alan upon Foster, this, obviously. and it's in the uh, cantina scene, as you described earlier in the movie, um, where Luke walks in. And there's one thing, there's one extra tiny little line that kind mm -hmm. of stood out to me, and it's just two, it's just, uh, two sentences, so let me just read this to you. It says, they'll, they'll, they'll have to wait outside. Now, obviously, this is the bartender speaking. They'll have to wait outside. We don't yeah, yeah. serve them in here. I only carry stuff for organics. Not, he concluded with an expression of distaste, mechanicals. And that, and, and, and the mechanicals is in quotes here. And that struck me as very interesting because mm. that, that line isn't in the movie. It's not in The New Hope. So in this book where it sort of really stresses the idea of organics versus Correct. mechanicals, which I really felt was pretty interesting. And he says, I only carry stuff for organics, you know, with an expression of distaste, not mechanicals. So that, I, I thought that was really pretty telling, actually. Well, it's funny because when I posted that whole question in, in this uh, Facebook uh, page, you know, I, I started to get a lot of traction on the page and people were posting their opinions and this and that. And some people were saying, oh, the reason why he doesn't like them, because my, my personal theory was that, well, you know, New Hope takes place over here. This is after, obviously, the, the Clone Wars. So maybe after the Clone Wars, the Galactic Republic or whatever, or now the Empire, really, they became distrustful of droids because they were fighting the droid army and they won over the droid army. So now maybe they're going through like a period where they, everybody hates droids and everybody is, is, is prejudiced of droids and distrustful of droids. So that was my theory. You know, something happened to him. <laughs> then somebody mentioned, Oh, by the way, they just put out a book recently called from a certain point of view which is 40 stories celebrating 40 years of Star Wars. And it's basically 40 authors doing, uh, you know, very short stories. <laughs> and one of them, ironically, you know, not to open up another can of worms, by Chuck Wendig, is the story of that bartender of the, you know, your, your droids are not welcome here. You know, they're going to have to wait outside. That whole – so he kind of gives you a backstory about how – spoiler alert – that yes, during the Clone Wars, uh, his family or his parents were killed by droids. So ever since then, he's been, you know, traumatized. So he hates droids. So it's like, okay, there's somebody kind of backing up my theory, even though I'm sure he wrote the story first, but I had no clue that he had written that story. And then some people were also posting kind of like what you were saying that, well, you know, droids don't consume, they don't spend money. So the bartender just doesn't want people in the bar that are not going to spend any money. Or maybe they're going to bother the customers, or maybe they're going to spy on the customers. You know, the customers don't want witnesses. They don't want droids that can record their conversations, and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So there was a lot of good, uh, you know, ideas of, of why, you know, that guy had that reaction. Yeah, exactly. You know, is that a and, general and, and actually, reaction um, that a lot of people we have? Topic, or is he just actually, a crazy actually, old guy? My you know? sister, who's <laughs> what a is it? Star Wars fan as well, about this. And, and, she, and, and her, her, her initial reaction was, oh, yeah, you know, they probably are second class citizens. And she, her, the, the first mm -hmm. thing she pointed out, the first thing she, she brought up was, you know, this bartender who had such like a, you know, a, a nasty, you know, we don't serve their kind here, you know, you know reaction. 
so yeah, and, and you're right. I love the the Chuck Wendig story. I believe the the story literally is called right. "We Don't Serve Their Kind Here." <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 it does play into the fact that. And I, I never really thought about it until you had mentioned it previously exactly, about the fact exactly. that, you know, the, the Clone Wars would still be pretty fresh in people's minds. I mean, from from A New Hope, from the end of the Clone Wars, it was probably 20 years um, at most. Yeah, Luke's, yeah, Luke's maybe, what, 16? So Maybe even less, because Luke, Luke is, what, a teenager? 18, I'll say, uh, at most uh, years. And the fact that, you know... So he was born at the end of the Clone Army, Wars, so, yeah. And, and, you know, it was so widespread, and yeah, the, the like reaction that. it caused across the galaxy, yeah. It, it would make perfect sense that it would be a, a, a new burgeoning distrust of droids. Right. The winners of the war get to decide, you know, who the bad guys are now and, and who you should fear. Just like in any political situation, the winner makes the rules. The winner rewrites history. So, yes, all droids are bad, you know, that kind of thing. The other thing also to keep in mind is that even if you go a little forward into Return of the Jedi, going into not so much the droids, but Ula, the, the slave dancer, you know, there's another proof that even back then, meaning when even Lucas was in charge, that the idea of these outer worlds that sort of thing existed <laughs> you know she wasn't a she wasn't a uh an employee of java and, and, and un the, uh, unless some bizarre yeah, employment right. and, that and you requires you to wear a chain around your neck and then you get thrown into a monster <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, and I mean, and even again, bringing it back to Clone Wars, and they were very smart because they had so much yeah, room to Twi'leks. play with in Clone Wars. Her particular race, uh, I, I don't know if they were Twi'leks or something else. Uh, the, the ones with the, the, the long uh, hair. <laughs> Like you, that's it. There was a couple of episodes, uh, I think even having to do with maybe Ahsoka or someone else, where they're liberating prisoners uh, from that planet and they're being used as slave labor. I, I don't know if it was by the Separatists or by somebody. So, you know, they, they kind of give you the background of why are they picking on this specific race of of different, you know, alien looking people? What is it about them that all of a sudden, you know, the, the huts, you know, control some of them and the separatists control some of them. So they, they did kind of build the background there quite a bit. Like we were just saying, if you go in chronological order, you know, you can kind of say, all right, everything starts in the prequels. And then you move on to some of these current movies like Rogue One and Solo. Now, Solo basically throws a grenade into the whole thing because it brings the subject right out in the open, but and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But let's just go forward a little bit, at least in the chronological sense. Then you have the original trilogy, which, again, is where we learned the, the majority of the information, really, uh, of where all this, for the first time we heard it, you know, as far as Star Wars goes. Empire touches it a very little bit. Jedi touches it a little bit, too. And then you move to the current films, where... For the most part, does the, at over least the topic this, of this current itself, trilogy seems to kind of ignore kind of that subject altogether. Focus of doing like you know human and droid slavery, and it you know opens up the topic of something like the whole cancel bite scene with um li you know liberating you know the the, the imprisoned five years you know the, the horse type races. So 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 uh, I mean there there always is some sort of you know downtrodden uh you know race yeah, or yeah. or you know species even in the newer ones they, they seem to have some sort of um uh, and and even in force awakens um uh, ray she was uh, she, she wasn't a slave per se but she was definitely living with um I, now his name is going to escape me um the, the the big yeah uncle plot right 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 uncle plot uh, uh, uncle plot yeah yeah and it's almost like yeah. indentured servitude type of scenario. It's not legally slavery, but it's like your entire life is, it's like you're working for the company and, and you right. have to shop at the company store and you have right. to sleep in the company hotel and you have to, everything is the company. So this guy basically owns everything that she needs. But here's the thing that I find interesting is that the, the first thing we have to kind of also figure out is, you know, is there a legitimate beef with the way that droids are being treated? And we do see many examples. Like I said, I'm going to go through them, but the question is, if droids are just machines, then you can do whatever you want with them. You can turn them off, you can turn them on, you can treat them bad, you can treat them good. It doesn't really matter. But the question is, are they sentient or not? Now, Star Wars, tippy toes, asks a few questions, but really doesn't dive deep into them. Solo yeah. does something with it, but it doesn't really get to the root of the question, if you will. 
if you wanted to really examine that issue of, in other words, sentience, what 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 makes a, a, a machine a sentient machine, you know, artificial intelligence and that sort of thing, you would have to watch a couple of other movies. Now, granted, because in reality, we don't have that answer yet. You know, we have theories of things like the Turin test and, and you know, whether or not a machine could trick you into believing it's a person. If you, if you ask them certain questions and you're not actually looking at a machine versus a person, if you're just examining the answer could they trick you into that if you want to go that route there are great movies out there whose purpose you know the, the whole subject matter of the movie is that and television shows and stuff like that so let me give you some examples blade runner that's the most modern god daddy of all of these having to do with machines that are so human yeah, life that you blade get to Runner's a point where essential you can't treat really. them like machines anymore is there a moral dilemma Yeah. And to a certain extent, I would even say the movie Alien, because it does deal with artificial intelligence. And even the newer films, the newer Alien films, they kind of lean more in that direction. And I know that indirectly behind the scenes, like through some Easter eggy material, they're trying to connect those two franchises together as if they exist within the same universe, which doesn't surprise me at all, since Ridley Scott was the director of those films to begin with. So if you want kind of like intellectual thinking about sentience for and droids, it, it was you go over there. Very, you go very, to very a movie good. like Ex Machina. Yeah, Did you see Ex Machina? Really and, and it surprised me, too. Because, I, I love that um, movie. I, I didn't really expect it to be that deep, I suppose. And, but yeah, really, really also good watching. Oh, yes. Exactly. You go to another movie, like, for example, The Matrix, where it's funny because in The Matrix, the backstory is the, the sentience part. I mean, we, we know these machines. This is, there's also almost like a subgenre where it's not so much whether a machine is sentient or not, whether you feel sorry for them or not. It's more of the fact that they already kind of taken over and it's out of control. So, you know, is intelligence enough to admit sentience? If they have power over you, are you relinquishing the argument of are you sentient or not? So the Matrix kind of puts you right there in that. And I would even say there was an animated film called The Animatrix, I believe, which gives you the history of how the machines little by little were oh, created yeah, yeah. and abused and then took over. That gets you to where the Matrix takes place. So that's that's a really cool thing. I remember it's very anime-ish, uh, the, the, the little short films that they did in that animated uh, feature. In the same vein, obviously, the movie like The Terminator and that whole franchise, you know, you're not even asking the question of sentience. The machines are in charge. Deal with it. You know, that's it. A little closer to home in, in television, for example, Star Trek, The Next Generation, just about anything dealing with the character Data. If you remember that, they've had so many episodes, and it's, they even had one specific episode all about him being declared Starfleet property, whether or not they could just decommission him and take him apart. So that was a cool one where they kind of explore that whole sentience issue. The movie 2001, you know, machine that really kind of out of control. Uh, the movie AI, artificial intelligence, the one that uh, Spielberg did, kind of took over when Kubrick couldn't finish it. The movie I, Robot, once again, we're dealing now in Isaac Asimov territory. Classic sci-fi, are machines sentient or not? Westworld, not only the movie, but the television show deals with a lot of that whole stuff about, you know, people, these machines are so human-like now that they're taking basically over. You have some lighter tones, like, for example, Wally, -E, or even Short Circuit, if you go back many years, Chappie, which wasn't that great, but again, deals with, you know, a machine that people are trying to take apart and, you know, oh, I you kind of feel that, sorry yeah. for her. It's, it's I never really saw this movie, but, but I heard it's, it's, it's very it's much in this in vein called it, uh, Her. It, it, it with sort of deals Phoenix. with, with oh, a sort of a what if relationship between, you know, a human and something that's, um, an AI. And the interesting thing about that is that it takes it a step further in that uh -huh. not only is the AI, you know, are obviously artificial, it, it, it doesn't even have a physical body. Uh, it's like a little earpiece that you we, that you wear, and and you can carry it around, and and you know talk to it, and she'll talk back to you. Mm -hmm. So that was very interesting to see that. So. <laughs> And you also have something, again, more fantastical and sci-fi, like the Transformers. You know, obviously, it's all a big shoot 'em up fight, romp, you know, romp and stomp and type of thing. But you are dealing with 
they're robots, no, you know, more or less. And, 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 you know, do you treat them like machines or do they, you know, some of them are basically in charge. So that's more of the, uh, I would consider it more of the Terminator territory in terms of how dangerous they can get. And even again, also most recently going back to television, the remake of the show Lost in Space has a character that is a robotic character that is very, emotional and very you know do we take them apart do we trust them do you know how do we treat them you know it kind of tackles that subject too so again if you are looking for a for a definitive answer you're not going to find one because in reality there is no rule or law or proof of anything at this stage on films and television there's plenty of ideas out there and each film basically writes its own rules but bringing this whole thing back to star wars now the question is what are the star wars rules you know has the question of sentience ever been discussed you know, uh, at least in front of the movies or in a television uh, environment, like a, one of the animated shows or anything like that. And I don't think they've really touched upon it to the point where it could be considered solid, solid canon. Like we mentioned earlier, with Star Wars, there's a lot of conversations that take place, most of them coming from C-3PO towards R2. And obviously, we can't hear R2. We can't understand R2. So C-3PO is kind of talking for almost for both of them. He's having the conversation and we understand them. But during New Hope, they were more prominent characters than in the rest of the original trilogy, in the rest of the prequel trilogy, the little cameos they've had here or there in some of those in between uh, yeah, films, exactly. and, and just even the new trilogy, that one they're bit. also kind of like uh, background characters, right? It, interestingly enough that when R2-D2 and C-3PO were introduced in um, A New Hope, one of the inspirations that George Lucas had was a movie by Kurosawa called The Hidden Fortress. Yes. And in that movie, R2-D2 and C-3PO play the sort of roles that are in The Hidden Fortress the movie. And so, interestingly enough, those those two characters are peasants. And they're, they're, they're kind of like the lowly, you know, people, you know, of the clan. Yeah, 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 exactly. And and there's these two like, comic relief peasants. They're like bumbling and that's how fools see, kind know, of characters. The, the eyes of them. So it's just interesting the fact that, you know, the, the two first characters in Star Wars are droids and they're sort of the peasant roles in the first movie. Right. And he did that on purpose. It wasn't by accident. It was by design in terms of he wanted them to be our eyes. They were the more or less narrators of the story he was telling. And I guess you got to a certain point where he was like, OK, everybody understands what the story is now. Let's put him to the side a little bit and let the story now speak for itself. Because Star Wars, you know, the amount of movie screen time that they get is way more than in any of the other sequels or trilogies or standalones or all that other stuff. You know, it's kind of there. And let's go through a few of the uh, of the interactions that they have. Because in other words, what would prove to us, again, not in reality, but in the Star Wars world, that these beings are sentient beings? So, for example, what, what would you say? I would say things like, for example, okay, they can think by themselves. They have intelligence. They can suffer pain. Pain. They can express joy, express pleasure. They can be scared. They can be happy. Can they lie? Can they hurt other people on purpose? You know, all of those things that would associate, you know, a human being, for example. Now, granted, we're under the impression that in Star Wars world, creatures have all the sentient rights, more or less, than a human being would have. Now, granted, the Empire might not feel exactly that way, but it is kind of understood that creatures are creatures. Whether you're a Wookiee or, or, or a human or whatever the heck you are, you're like on one side right. of the, and of the also, table. The question the is, do droids also, and or do certain droids also belong see, there? You know, options and be able to reason out which one is the better path for itself. And it, well, I guess, quote unquote, it's master, which is a word that we hear a lot right. in, in, uh, coming from droids, where they, they say, you know, they, they refer to, you know, their owner as a master, which is a very. Right. Um... Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, that's a loaded that's a loaded word based on our own personal history. But at the same time, you've got to remember, Jedi's also have, and this is because of the, uh, the, I guess, the Japanese influence of the characters. They have this master apprentice also relationship, right, which good point, it's good not point. meant to be ownership. It's meant to be a teacher. Your master is your teacher. 
you know, again, like like in Japanese historical hierarchy, I guess. Another thing that you can throw into the mix of whether sentience or not is the ability or the desire to believe in a higher form, in a god or or something or some kind of spirituality. You know, is that also a characteristic of sentience? I don't know. It could be. And so let's examine, you know, all these different examples that I've, I've written down here, you know, from, from just droids, you know, and how they're interacting. For example, as soon as Star Wars starts, C-3PO is talking to R2 and he's talking about how he's like, oh, we're going to be destroyed for sure. This is madness. We're doomed. You know, he's expressing fear as far as I'm concerned. We'll be sent to the spice mines of Kessel and smashed into who knows what. Again, this is complete fear. You know, he's afraid that he's going to be destroyed. So you can kind of say, all right, there's some, there's something there. He's constantly complaining. We seem to be made to suffer. It's a lot in life. Okay. Complaining, complaining, upset. When they actually reach Tatooine, what's really interesting, and to me, it's another sign of that, is that R2 wants to go one way. C3P goes the other way. They argue about it and they go in two different ways. So it's kind of like they're not unified, even in their own programming or in their own mission. Now, granted, R2-D2 has a specific mission, but the fact that they are not subservient well, yeah, definitely. automatically and, and to, to each other, that, to me, tells you know, me when you think that there's about something it, more going we're on We're looking here. at the more practical side of it. You know, these joys have to be programmed somehow, so they have to follow some sort of, you know, some sort of coding. So someone has to have applied this, you know, I, I guess, you know, if-then yeah. type of, you know, programming to them. So... I mean, is 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 that all they're doing? When C three PO expresses fear, is it, is he genuinely afraid, or is he reacting to his coding, saying that this situation is dangerous? Let me express fear, or is it, or is it more the front lines of you know he wants to you know self preservation, he wants to preserve himself <laughs> as like his number one goal. So it's very, very, it's very odd to see you know what is it? Are, are they actually following just programming that someone you know gave them, or is it sort of, sort of a self independence of uh, emotions and everything. The problem is that you can even make that argument. I mean, again, I don't know if in Star Wars world you have the, the scientific ability to determine whether a human being is being brave because he is programmed through his DNA to be brave or because that's a choice he made. He flipped the coin and said, scared or brave, coward or bravery. And he goes one way or the other. But you could say, well, this guy's always, you know, whenever he gets into that kind of conflict, he always goes in that direction. You can anticipate how a person will react. But in a way, you can kind of say the same thing with the droids. Right. They've been programmed that, a certain because, way. I mean, but what happens if they do something unexpected? C-3PO, a person can also do that. No offense, known for his cowardice. If we were to see him suddenly, you know, brandish, <laughs> you know, like a weapon and go out charging, you know, which actually now I'm thinking about it, we did see that in Attack of the Clones. But, 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 but you know, <laughs> if, if we were to suddenly see him, you know, do something completely out of the ordinary, it would kind of throw a wrench in it saying, you know, okay, well, is he reacting from programming or is he making his own decision? Right. Now, when, when they split apart and they go two different directions, C-3PO kicks R2 and says, yeah, yeah, you go that way, and gives him a kick. And it's like, why would a robot kick another robot in anger? What can you robotically accomplish by that? What can you logically accomplish by doing that? Absolutely nothing. That is a hissy fit. That's what a little kid does. So it's again, it's, it's another weird trait that doesn't really fit a robot. It fits more of a person, you know, throwing a tantrum. He's calling for help when he sees the, the, the Jawa sand crawler. He's like, Hey, I'm saved. I'm saved. Again, he's, he's always scared. He's always scared. What's interesting is also the Jawas put a restraining bolt on him and R2D2 also, which is a way of keeping them subservient to keep them from running away from, from being able to shut them off easier than, I guess, finding the secret button that's, I guess, behind his neck or something. Or this way they don't run away. So that's another kind of yep. typical, uh, you could say a, a way to, to, to keep your slave uh, from running away from you. They, they do make a special point about that. And it's funny because the, the restraining bolt is something that I then started looking around and it doesn't seem to show up later in the movies it kind of goes away so it's something about the jawas because of their particular occupation which they're really junk dealers but they're dealing with robots too so they're it's a combination of like slave masters and junk dealers you know something like that which is bizarre 
when they're inside the uh, the sand crawler, he he even asks uh, Artu. He says, "Do you think they're going to melt us down?" You know, again, he's terrified. They're brought to be sold at a block, you know, an area where they stand them all up, and they're trying to sell them to the Skywalkers and to Uncle Owen. It's yeah, almost like he's buying. A, 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 a co- there's a couple of new cars out there, and he's trying you know, to figure out which car best fits his needs. Appliances, really. They're they're you know the the toaster ovens or cars or you know. Just, just everyday items to to the people of of this world, which is, which yep. is basically you know they're just property, and, that, and that's why that's why you're saying with the restraining bolt because you know to, to them it's just you know property to be traded and used. Right. Luke, on the other hand, seems to treat them a little better. Now, he kind of goes along with the rules of the environment, let's say, of, yes, yeah, come here. Okay, we got this one. I got that one. That one's broken. Give me that other one. You know, he, but he seems a lot nicer, a lot friendlier to them than, than some of these older people that don't really care about him. But here's a line that's really interesting that I found. When C-3PO is getting his oil bath and he's like, oh, finally, I feel so much better now. He goes, thank the maker. And it's like, the maker? Wait a minute. Is that supposed to be their version of a god? Because wouldn't that be like saying, thank goodness, or thank, you know, thank God, or something like that? So that's a line that I'm, I'm like, wait a minute, these guys are yeah, a little yeah. more and, 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 and deep that line is than always, I think it always just me as, you know, a regular, a, a, a you know, very toaster. choice of words for him to say maker and not, you know, thank, uh, you know, thank my programmer or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's like they have a specific word that doesn't necessarily specify one person, but it's kind of like an overall encompassing word, you know. So there's very, a, very well again. Be. I don't think that was done by accident. I think that was done on. It was written that way on purpose. Now, the droids, especially C three PO, he's very quick to kind of accept his destiny in terms of. He tells R two, "It's like Luke is our new master now, so you better behave yourself." So he's kind of used to that relationship you know being owned and bossed around by whoever happens to be yeah, his, I his mean, latest and, and owner. which makes so sense he's kind of fact that, perpetuating you know, if, if, you you know, know that I, behavior I in a way like order of the movies you know his prior history was you know him basically you know being you know created and you know into ownership and bounced around from you know person to person and you know ordered around basically his, his whole uh, droid life yeah yeah. Now, talking about the uh, the ability to lie, the the ability to deceit, you know, is that something that you could say a machine could learn to do? Again, I don't know if right now a machine could do that or would do that. In a lot of movies, you are dealing with machines that are lying to you because they're trying to kill you, for example. But in Star Wars, if you think about it, R2-D2 is like the biggest liar around. You know, right off the bat, he tells C-3PO, you know, to tell Luke, can you just remove the restraining bolt? Because I have this message and I might be able to play the whole message if you remove the restraining bolt. And then Luke takes off the bolt and the message goes away. And he's like, hey, what happened to the message? Oh, sir, it's just a malfunction, blah, blah, blah. Right, yeah, so yeah. They're almost kind of covering for each other. It, it, it but R2 the, is not the, making the a mistake. Question. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's lying. Nice. He wants to get the hell like, out of it. You can prove one with the other. But then again, it, you, can bring, you can bring up the fact that, you know, is, is he just following his programming, you know, to a T? <laughs> You know, saying, you know, okay, in order for me to get this message to Obi-Wan, I have to, you know, do these certain actions, X, Y, and Z. So, right. it, you know, it just, it just plays the fact that, you know, it's, it's so it's so open right now. We don't, we don't really know what's their free will, like, where they're thinking on the fly, mm-hmm. or rather what's completely hard-coded, scripted into their coding. Right. And he, again, continues to argue with, with C-3PO because C-3PO wants him to behave and he won't behave. When after he runs away, C-3PO is hiding in the garage and then Luke is looking around and he's like, oh, sir, do- oh, please don't deact. Again, C-3PO is terrified of everything. Don't deactivate me, you know, all that kind of stuff. And once they find uh, R2-D2 again, he's like, you know, why did you run away? You know, Luke is your new master now. Again, reminding him of the new ownership, completely ignoring whatever mission it is that R2 is under. And R2 is also hiding from people. because You know, he also experiences fear or whatever you want to call it. You know, he's hiding from the sand people. When 
Obi-Wan finds them and Luke finally wakes up and they're going to leave there and they realize, oh, we forgot C-3PO's over there and his arm has been removed because the Sam people, they hurt him or whatever. And C-3PO's like, oh, leave me behind, you know, save yourselves, I'm done for. That's another layer of, wait a minute, he's, he, in his own way, he wants to sacrifice himself for the good of the others, which is another trait that you could say... A machine really wouldn't do that. That's more of a human thing or a sentient being thing where right. you can, in a way, yeah, kind of like give your later, life but up in for the movie, other people's one, benefit. The big robot. So that's another himself, interesting one. Pretty much the same thing. He basically sacrifices himself. Um, he at the end he sacrifices himself to save this is the mission. Yeah, Jin and uh, exactly. And so yep, yep, same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Program. Yeah, yeah. Even Actually, though he was a, a, a an empire another, robot, an imperial robot that was on reprogrammed, <laughs> but it's like, well, what happened? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now we talked about the bartender scene. We know exactly that's that's in your face. They're throwing very specific examples of we don't serve their kind. To me, that entire scene also. Could be another way of interpreting that scene is that because Lucas, I think, wanted to have this old West look to Tatooine, especially the cantina, it's you're in a Western now. And to me, that kind of felt like a, uh, you know, the, the rough bartender with the rough crowd and this boy walks in, you know, very young, innocent with his friends and his friends are different. So in a Western, you could say his friends could be, if it's your typical Western scenario, his friends could be people from another country. Country. It could be a Mexican individual, you know, in the Wild West where they're like, I don't think I like that kind. Or it could be a black person and it's like, oh, what the hell is this? You know, you know, they could be having that kind of weird Western, yeah, yeah, exactly. you know, stereotypical yeah, yeah, Western no, reaction true, to the person that's Wars, different. We don't so really see that's racism another possibility. as we do, you know, in our you know, world right now. So as a stand in for that, you know, well, what, what, no. what else would, you know, what would be the next you right. know, thing and you know AI that would be something you know like, a, 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 like a, an appliance would be something that would be discriminated against not necessarily skin color anymore right right and and you got to remember with Star Wars it's supposed to be a fun movie you got to always, always remember this because we take this so serious and we go so deep so crazy we fall in the rabbit hole and we don't come out it's a children's film Lucas has said it a million times it's supposed to be entertaining. Yes, you're supposed to have a, a smart story, a logical story. But the bottom line is that it's supposed to be fantastical. So you cannot <laughs> get, you know, you can't turn Star Wars into Schindler's List or Saving Private Ryan. You can't. You can't do that. That's not Star Wars. That You want to have a serious film, you have a serious film. And you can think and you can cry and you can, you know, twist yourself into a pretzel trying to figure out, you know. But Star Wars is supposed to be fun. So... This is his way, I guess, of giving you a little morsel of some kind of a social issue, for example, without doing a deep dive into it. So I think, more or less, that's what he was trying to throw at us in that cantina scene. Here's another one, Han Solo. Han Solo is a good guy, but he also has a dislike of droids, not as much as the bartender, but he's yeah, like, the, the, the you know, he says, hello, sir, and look, Solo like, uh, just gives okay. him the dirtiest <laughs> looks and ignores him and... <laughs> Oh, yeah, it's like, oh, whatever. The whole thing about let the Wookiee win, you know, he's it's ridiculous that you would have to let somebody more or less cheat and, and do it right in front of you and accept it because yeah, hey, say, yeah, he's gonna beat you up if you don't let him cheat. Of, it's like, okay, you know, all right, I'll let him cheat, you know, that kind of thing. Well, being intimidated rather, you know, into letting someone else win, which is again a very interesting <laughs> trait for a robot to, you know, throw the game, you know. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Let him win. Go ahead. Let him win. That's fine. That's perfectly fine. In the Death Star, Chewbacca roars at the little mouse droid, and the mouse droid, you can hear him whimpering and running in the opposite direction. Again, it's an intimidation. A growling creature intimidates a little tiny robot. It's like, could you intimidate your toaster? Not really. You know, so... Is yeah, the definitely. Yeah, and, and, and that's actually going. You know, that's it, exactly the what these films is. You know, you that's how I see it. You know, you sometimes notice things like that. It, it, that completely slipped my mind. That's that's actually a good, definitely a good catch. Right. Now, we just talked about a little bit about how R2-D2 is willing to lie to get his way, you know, with Luke at least. After 
the droids are discovered by the stormtroopers hiding in the closet, C-3PO comes out and he's like, oh, they're madmen. They're heading towards the detention block, which you could say, okay, he's kind of saying the truth. He's telling them the truth because he's telling them to go exactly where they are going. Granted, they've already been there and done whatever they did. And he's like, but my, my little friend here, all the, all the excitement, you know, he's blown a circuit or something. I'm going to take him to maintenance now. So now C-3PO is lying. So it's like, wait a minute. C-3PO is also capable of lying yeah, yeah, to and, save and his skin, basically. And, and they do you know, it. They get out of there. They get out of that jam to, by lying. To, to cover it up. Yeah, it, it, basically, he, he's, you know, saying, okay, you know, you got a contingent of armed <laughs> guards here. I'm going to say whatever I need to to save my programming and, and continue on with the mission. So, yeah, exactly. Well, he, he even asks Han and, and Luke, he's like, sir, what do we do if they if they come here? And they're like, well, close the door and hope they don't have blasters. They, they really didn't give him much to go on. So they're like, oh, I don't know. What are we supposed to do? When they're all in the garbage compactor and they finally stopped it from, you know, uh, R2 stops it from, from crushing them. And they can hear them screaming in joy. But C-3PO thinks that they're screaming in agony. And he's like, oh, my God, what have I done? You know, this is horrible. The, he's completely entrenched in grief. And yeah, again, and, and another his, his example of, was, of feeling, of feeling body, bad, I having enough. remorse, you know. It, uh, you know. Yeah, yes. yeah, when you say we again yeah, curse my metal body, like, that's a, or something, that's you know, a that's, pseudo that's saying, religious it's, it's thing, you know. It's like, oh, that's factors. interesting. So, very interesting choice of words, yeah, right. Also, before they go on the bombing run, uh, C-3PO is very worried for R2-D2 not getting hurt, which, again, the, he spends the three quarters of the movie fighting with him and arguing with him, and now he's very worried about him. Oh, don't get hurt. You know, just come back. Make sure you come back to me. You know, that kind of thing. It's like, oh, that's weird. And during the battle itself, he's he's all fidgety and, oh, R2, R2. And then when they come back, which R2 got blown up, but he's still kind of functional, more or less, and they're going to repair him. He's like, sir, I'll, I'll, I'll gladly donate any parts, you know, to save him. Again, Again, he's he's willing to give of himself for someone else. This time, not a person, but another droid, which is again another characteristic yeah, that enough, you know can kind of tilt come the, back the needle into the sentient no, part, as far as I'm concerned. You know, C three P is like beside himself. You know, emotionally distraught. You can tell, and and the, and the rest of them, yeah, the rest of them, are like, oh, I'm sure he'll be fine. I'm mm-hmm. sure uh, they'll fix him. Or whatever. And, and they, 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 him. they go <laughs> off and you know have, have a grand old time. Yeah, don't worry about <laughs> it. Ah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> The, the, the droid is basically dead. <laughs> exactly. And they, they, they totally blow him off. <laughs> all new and shiny. I know. Obviously, at the end, he comes back all new, clean, and you know, all new parts and everything. So it's like, okay, that's cool. Now, let's jump over to Empire now. Now, Empire does something in the beginning that's kind of unusual that we haven't seen yet. Well, you can kind of say that. The first droid that we're introduced to in Empire is a probe droid. And a probe droid is a funny droid because I never really understood a probe droid until I finally watched Rogue One. And the reason is because from all the pictures I've seen from the shot in Empire where Han hits the probe droid and explodes... I never could tell the dimensions of a probe droid. I, I always thought it was this gigantic spider thing. But then, you know, through looking at pictures, through looking at Clone Wars, through looking at other stuff, and even Rogue One, a probe droid is, is kind of small. It's, it's a small floaty kind of robot. And the fact that this robot has guns built into it is something different that we hadn't seen yet in a Star Wars movie, because obviously the prequel trilogies, they're not coming for years. So now they're introducing well, wait a minute. Robots can have guns. Robots are allowed to carry weapons. That's that's weird. I've never seen that before. So that's a little bit of an introduction with with robots and weapons. However, we did also have the interrogation droid in A New Hope that comes floating to to kind of inject Leia with something. So can you kind of say that the interrogation droid is a sentient beam, or is it more of a of a device or, or, or you know, or, or a toaster, you know, uh, th- there seems to be almost a difference. In other words, not every robot we meet in New Hope has the personality, has the interaction that C-3PO and R2-D2 show. Now, granted, we don't see them. You know what I mean? Th- there could be conversations happening all over the world in that world between droids and people that we never get to see. We only experience R2 and C-3PO. So do you think that all the droids are having these kind of 
interactions that would lead no, somebody to believe they're sentient? Droids, or do you I think, think that it's only happening with certain a, droids you know, a for some reason? conversation with an interrogation droid. I, I mean, it, 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 it'd be a one-sided conversation, you know, with me <laughs> spilling my guts to it. But... <laughs> Well, remember, C-3PO is a protocol droid. His whole purpose is right. translation and interaction with other beings. So that's his thing. But even R2, who is right. not now, a talking droid, you he also shows a lot of emotion just with his film, beeps and his actions. Later on in Empire Strikes Back, where we see the lineup of bounty hunters, there's one bounty hunter, IG-88, who is a complete droid, but he's an, assa- oh, he's an assassination yeah. droid. So, mm-hmm. um, I mean, in the EU, he actually does have, so you yep. can actually, he actually, you know, thinks he, he, he's, he's very much conscious. So, and that brings up another thing, like, like some of the droids that are weaponized, yeah. like the probe droid, like you said, I, I, I can't really say that they have any sort of personality, but I, I don't think they have any sort of consciousness going on. But on the other hand, you have IG-88, who is 100% conscious, and he makes his own decisions, and he has his own, you know, story, and he's a droid. So, you, you know, there definitely are these conversations that are probably happening, you know, not just with, like, droids like C-3PO, but other droids that are allowed to have weapons, but they do have like a, a, a higher consciousness to them. I, I would take it as far as also for LOM, because right. in that Bounty Hunter roster, you also have one that is has a, a protocol body, but kind of like a bug head. I think he's a robot because, again, yep. his designation is 4LOM. Those are letters and numbers that are usually assigned only to droids. So, yeah, that, that's a, that's another, you know, monkey wrench. And it's like, wait a minute. These guys don't work for the Empire. These guys don't work for the Rebels. They're independent contractors. And how do they give them so yeah, much exactly. authority and what do they do to carry not, weapons when, when and, to, there is no and to bounty act to like a had. bounty hunter? What so it's like, what the hell is this about? These guys are doing. I, I mean, are they just walking around aimlessly? Like, I, really, the other <laughs> question is, what do droids do if they don't have a master? So, yeah, 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 yeah right, exactly. <laughs> And what yeah, do they better, spend their money better, on? <laughs> better weapons. You, you, you that chrome, do they that get more parts for themselves? You know, on, on. Get, get, get that oil bath? <laughs> <laughs> Who the heck knows? But again, in the, like I said, in Empire, again, not like uh, New Hope, there's not as much information because R2 and C-3PO kind of get relegated to the background. And the majority of the interactions that we see, they're really punchlines. Anything C-3PO does is a punchline. Han, Han Solo wants him to shut up, so he kind of covers his mouth. And he's like, blah, 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 you know, he, he shuts him up that way. When Luke and Han are out there, especially Luke in the, in the snow, R2 is worried about him. And he's he's jittering and he's with the little, uh, he's got a little radar going. He's, he's He's worried about Luke. And again, you start to see now what we consider emotions coming from even an astromech droid, you know, which is even a protocol droid. You have medical droids now introduced into this film, which not as personal as C-3PO, but they do have this kind of doctor-ish kind of conversation, you know, with your patients. So that's that was an interesting uh, addition to it. Han also treats basically all droids. It's not just C-3PO. They, they, I think there's a Treadwell droid helping him fix the Falcon, and he's kind of like yelling at it. It's like, no, there, you go there, go there. No, stop, don't move. You know, he's being rude to them too. At one point when they're escaping, it's kind of cute because Han and Leia are running through the halls, the, the ice caverns, and they go through a door and the door closes and C-3PO is like stuck outside that door. And he's like, oh, what do I do now? <laughs> and then you see the door opens and Han See, reaches it, it, and grabs it, him by it, the arm it, and brings him in. So it's like, oh, he does like him. He's like, he's not that, he doesn't gone. hate him that much. So it was kind of cute. Oh, forget it. He would have been, yeah. And it's funny because in, in Empire, in, in, at Hoth, at the Rebel base, you do see a red colored protocol droid walking around. Yeah, like and you also see a white like colored dead. protocol droid yeah. that at the end is, he looks like he got blown up or something. But yeah, he's leaning against the side, but it's like, it's, it's like, wow, there are other protocol droids there. But again, we never get to meet these. Obviously, if you collect action figures, there's about, you know, a dozen of them, then you're like, oh, this guy's from that scene, this one's from that scene. But, you know, you never meet these guys. Later on in the asteroid field and the, the caves, uh, C-3PO gets startled by the Minox. So again, he's afraid of everything. Uh, creatures, uh, what could possibly happen? Bad guys, everybody scares C-3PO. At one point, Leia actually reaches a- around his neck and turns them off because he's like, he's so anxious and crazy sounding that he just, she's had enough. She's like, I'm just turning him off. So she turns him off. 
And before C-3PO gets blown up, you know, in uh, Bespin, when Chewbacca replays the recording of what he saw before he got blown into bits, he was like, oh, I must warn the others. I've been shot. So again, he is sounding like he's trying to be heroic. And he has a plan in his mind. I'm, I must warn them. And then he's like, I've been shot. So it's kind of like, okay, so he, he at least is not that much of a coward because he was going to do something uh, good, but then it all fell apart on him. So there is a little bit of that in Empire, at least, but nowhere near as much as a, a new hope. Now, let's move on to Jedi. We already mentioned the idea of the Twi'lek dancer that's supposed to be Jabba's slave dancer. There's just no way around that. That's what she is. And and again, that's may- maybe that's a little... Again, this is Lucas. So maybe that's the beginning of Lucas telling us that there is actual slavery that exists. We're not talking about droids anymore. We're only talking about actual beings now, you know, non-human beings. But they are doing that, at least in this part, you know, of the galaxy. Luke presents through the hologram Jabba with two gifts, these two droids, you know, they're for you, you know, your, your exaltedness, you know, all that stuff. So they're being treated again, like property, like they're just being given away to people and that sort of thing. And here's where it gets bizarre. The torture droids, we get to go to the catacombs of the Jabba's palace and there are droids Torturing yeah, other I'm, droids, I'm, I'm, and those yeah, droids are so screaming in pain. And, 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 and not you're only like, are they what the hell droids, is this there all seems about? to be a definite hierarchy of droids. I don't, know if, I, don't know, I don't know if you noticed this, but there definitely seems to be, you know, like, like even the droids are, are like subdivided <laughs> now into into sort of like a like a hierarchy of you know the, sort of like a master and you know. Right. But it seems to me like it's a predetermined uh, hierarchy. In other words, it's not like right. these models are better than those models. It's whatever Jabba decides, the, whoever he decides to be the boss, that's the boss. Because the, the <laughs> gonk droid is being tortured. And then they're like, oh, yeah, our last master translated wrong. And, and that's what happened to him. And then they cut to a shot of what it almost looks like a medical droid being uh, eviscerated. And it's like, why would you need to eviscerate if you're – okay, you're – you could just turn off the droid and it's over. But there is some – psychotic logic in putting them through pain and the fact that they can feel pain is another bizarre thing it's like wait a minute droids can actually feel pain it's like i never heard of that before so yeah that's kind of weird and kind of dark if you think about it for a kid movie to see that sort of thing but in a way here's where he can kind of get away with it it is also slightly humorous because it's a cutesy gunk roid, and the legs are going back and forth. You know, you get yeah, all that. Yeah. The and theme it's, of it it's is it's not pretty horrific, dark and grim, but it's kind of like dark. It's, it's like black humor, you know, comically. You know, you know, like, you know, like little steam coming off his feet and everything. But when you think about what's happening here, right? Yeah. Yeah, when you think about what's happening, though, it's a, it's a pretty dark. It's like scene. a cartoon almost. It's like watching Bugs Bunny or something. Exactly. And this is something that's going to come back, and we'll talk about it, on the prequel trilogy when it comes to dealing with bad guy droids. There's a lot of comedy involved. Slave Leia. Okay, here's a weird one. I guess we are also introduced to the concept that Jabba will take anybody as a slave at this point. It's not just uh, the Twi'leks. Now he's willing to take a willing. He decides he was going to take a, a human slave. He's going to take a human slave. Okay, fine. He's He's the boss. That's what he does. So... Again, does that mean that if, if the good guy's lost, Leia would be his next dancing girl, you know, on the roster until he throws her into the Rancor pit? You know, is that how it works in, in Jabba's world? I guess, I guess that's how it works. You know, it's a bizarre, you know, I know it's a criminal syndicate and it's a, uh, you know, the most deprived, uh, you know, place to make, to make the cantina look a hundred times worse, I guess. And that's, that's the point. It's funny because at one point, I forget in which movie C3PO tells, uh, uh, Luke or somebody else, you know, I'm not much of a story because when Luke is trying to say, you know, where did you serve? Who was your previous master? Oh, I don't remember. My last master was Captain Antilles, but I'm not a very good storyteller. Where in Return of the Jedi, C-3PO goes to tell the entire story yeah, of the yeah, previous I mean, two films to the Ewoks in recreating them, you know, in a storytelling mode where he's throwing sound effects and all kinds yeah, of stuff exactly. like that. Yeah, like, that so he's lying again. Chuckles, well, now we find out he was lying to Luke. It's not that he didn't remember. He just didn't want to tell. Sound effects going on, like everyone's enthralled with his story and everything. Yeah, it's like, wow, where did he get this from? 
During the Ewok attack, they are the bait that initiates the counterattack from the Ewoks. So they are kind of involved in the battle. Granted, C-3PO is not shooting at anybody, but he's he kind of voluntarily is the bait that says, hey, over here, I'm over here. Come and get me. I surrender or something like that. And that's what initiates that, that Ewok battle at the end. So, yeah, again, as you could see, not as much, not as many lines, not as many examples, but they do continue with all of this little examples of how, you know, I would consider them to be, you know, leaning a little more towards sentience. Now, let's jump to the prequels. And again, once again, we're going to be dealing with the same problem that we're no longer making them central characters. They're kind of B players or C players, really, if you think about it. And one of the biggest reasons, I think it's because Lucas decided, like you mentioned earlier, you know, for the prequels, that he wasn't going to pursue the whole droid sentience uh, slavery issue because he had bigger fish to fry, and that is people. He can now introduce actual slaves into the story, and that is the backstory of Anakin. The whole thing about him, you know, him and his mother were owned by a hut, and then they were sold to uh, to Watto, and blah, 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 and all this stuff, so... That all kind of goes in the background. Uh, we do meet other droids. There's the TC-14 protocol droid uh, that has a, a female voice in the beginning that is there to serve uh, drinks to the Jedi. And then the, uh, the the Modians attack and the droid just, he's really not, she's not very uh, yeah, aggressive. Much, yeah. She's just there to serve drinks and then get out of the way, basically. So there's, there's not much there to, for her to do. One of the things that they introduce in this film is a lot of droids because we're dealing with the pre-Clone Wars and how the Clone Wars actually happened. And we, we basically understand now that the, the bad guys or the, the manipulated bad guys have a robot army. So all of these battle droids, all these different versions of battle droids, which later in the other films, they get even, you know, super battle droids and this, you know, that kind of battle and that kind of battle droid. But the, the typical battle droid, they kind of turn them into these funny, kiddie-ish, very, again, Bugs Bunny, uh, Wiley Coyote kind of silly robots. Because, and again, my, my theory, you tell me, but my theory is, you know, can't do Saving Private Ryan. We can't have people's arms blowing off and blood spurting everywhere. You got to keep it light. So the only way to do a mass extermination of droids is to make them very, you know, robotic and non-human. In other words, strip away from them as much as possible of any of these qualities that we just discussed yeah, yeah. from and, C-3PO and, and, and R2-D2 the, the and them, just kind of make them fun. Like, and, and that's, you know, I think, what they did. Very generic faces, you know, nothing, yeah. there's no... Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's no, like, emotion... Well, 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 well I mean, none of the droids... And it's Roger, Roger. Everything is Roger, Roger. It's debatable, but, you know, these battle droids, the B-1s, they're very, you know very basic you know there's right. no there's, there's no personality at all so you know when the jedi like hack through them like you know a knife through butter you know there's we're not supposed to you know feel any like emotion to them it's like toys yeah yeah <laughs> Right. And they're always not cracking jokes, but their lines are like, well, who is he and who are you? And what? And they talk like this. And it's like, it gets kind of annoying after a while. And the other thing that they make us understand is that they are not autonomous in terms of they really have a, a big problem thinking for themselves. They have to have a control droid ship, which brings us to the climax of the film. You know, you blow up the control ship and they all kind of turn themselves off because they don't know what to do with themselves. And as opposed to regular droids that we've seen where they're not really directly controlled by any master control room. That's the thing about these droids there that you, you remove as much humanity uh, that you can. Yeah, but, from and, and them, that idea I guess actually, to make it sort them of goes away more really, because in the other movies, and, and especially in the books, that idea of having like a master control on and off switch really is not used ever again outside of Phantom Menace, which is sort of odd. Yep. Right. Now, because this is the prequel trilogy, we get to learn where R2-D2 and C-3PO came from. Now, obviously, C-3PO, we find out that Anakin built them from scratch, from spare parts. So that's interesting. Okay, you can kind of say, well, maybe there's part of Anakin in C-3PO's programming, or is the programming parts that came from other parts, so it's whatever Anakin was able to find in the junk shop. I don't know. But what I find even more interesting is that R2-D2 was basically a repair droid in the Queen's ship. And <laughs> once that ship gets damaged, they start through an elevator bringing up droids, like automatically, three or four droids 
And R2-D2 is the last one of those fourth because every single one that goes up, boom, gets knocked, destroyed, hit and destroyed, hit and destroyed. And R2 is the last one and he's able to push that little button and fix the, the engine or something to make it go a little faster to get away from the danger. And here's where it gets even weirder. He is brought down to the queen's chamber and the queen uh, formally congratulates R2-D2 and he's like, he's, he's to be commended and please clean him up. And, and Padme, obviously at this point, we, we don't understand that there's a decoy, there's a real Padme and there's real queen, real that. So Padme will go and, and take care of him. So I don't know. Was that the decoy? reacting in a bizarre manner or was she yeah, yeah. reacting and, 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 in that and, and, and bizarre manner another, because Padme where, had asked her to that, that was act like in that bizarre manner. was ship where it was, you know so, I mean? it was like, uh, you know, it's, or, and the Empire didn't exist at the time, but, you, you know, I, I'm sure the reaction and the tolerance of droids varies from planet to planet. So perhaps in on um, on Naboo, maybe droids are, are looked upon more as, you know, not just uh-huh. property or, or servants. They may have like a slightly higher uh, respect level uh, for droids on certain planets. So, Maybe, I don't know. But I mean, even in the medal ceremony at the end of Star Wars, not only does Chewbacca not get a medal, but multiple, you multiple figure, times. <laughs> well... <laughs> R2-D2 has been around a long time and he saved everybody's butt a couple times. They could have given him a medal too. <laughs> you know, they're not treating him as good as right now they're treating him at this point. It's almost like at this point he was a machine <laughs> and now he's been formally elevated to you're now something more important than just another machine. It's like, welcome to the club. You know, it was, it was like, okay, that's interesting because now he comes with them everywhere they go. She, you know, she follows, they follow her around, you know, that kind of thing. So that's, that's an interesting thing to have. And again, because I started getting kind of crazy paranoid, I keep looking for restraining bolts. He does not have a restraining bolt. They don't have a restraining bolt on him. So now, he's kind of like a willing point, a robot that's willing to do his job or whatever the heck his job happens to be. After the Clone Wars, if, is that something, is that something maybe that was then not required, but maybe oh. in higher demand because People were so paranoid, maybe, about droids, you know, sort of coming, to, you know, out of nowhere and and attacking, you know, from this fear of the Clone Wars. I wonder. I don't know, but I mean, like I said, I, I started looking specifically at every single shot that I could find of the original trilogy, and I could not find restraining bolts anymore. And then I looked at the newest trilogy, and I still don't see restraining bolts. So... Yeah, maybe that was just a leftover, yeah, you know, yeah, crazy yeah, thing. Or maybe, who knows, maybe it's just a Jawa thing. Maybe they're just psychotic or something. <laughs> yeah. The other thing, uh, going back to the uh, Anakin being a slave, is another thing that they mentioned that, and this is something they barely touched on, but it's really kind of creepy if you think about it. Slaves have an implanted chip that if they get too far away, they explode. So it's like, What? <laughs> And it's, it's in the script and it's in the movie. They actually do mention that, that if you get, that Anakin says he's working on trying to figure out a way of detecting the chip. This way he can remove it. And if you get too yeah, far, yeah. you go boom or something like that. And he goes, like, oh, wow, that's, such a good uh, job at, like, that's, that's dark. Really, <laughs> that's a little dark really stuff. It's really pretty graphic, you know, uh, themes. Yeah. And this scene is followed by a typical Jar Jar stupid thing. So again, he 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 gives you a kind of serious thing, but then he quickly gives you the the ridiculous yeah, like, funny hear, kitty <laughs> thing to kind of distract you from the from the creepy thing that was just said. I know, right? Pit droids. We see pit droids here again. Complete comic relief. No personality. They're just there to do. Uh, you know, yeah, like uh, one Laurel scene, and Hardy uh, the impersonations or like, something. They're just there to he, make you he laugh. He survives no. miraculously. Yeah, it's again, it's 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 and Lucas again. Lucas kept saying, "This is for kids. This is movies, not for fanboys. It's for kids." So it's like, okay, all right, we'll go along. Qui Gon even mentions at one point because Anakin asks him, you know, if they could, you know, is he here to free the slaves? He's like, no, I'm not here to free the slaves. I have another mission right now. So it is kind of understood that there is this system going on, and even Padme tells uh, Shmi uh, that because she's like. Why, you know, is there slavery here? She's like, that's outlawed in the Republic. And she's like, well, the Republic isn't here. You know, we're far away from the Republic. So it appears that 
it's kind of like in these faraway locations, it's, uh, you know, it's like a, a, a free for all. It's the Wild West. So people do whatever the hell they want and they are, they don't have yeah, any, exactly. yeah, any it, control. There, there is the, no in, in the uh, policing of, planets, you, you know, know, this kind of practice. The Republic can only reach so far. And, and I guess, you know, especially with, with like the, just the idea of, you know, on Tatooine where they have, you know, everything so, you know, backwater basically. Yeah, it's, it's basically, basically a free for all, and and slavery is something. I mean, I'm not sure how overt yeah, it is. Exactly. I, I guess I guess pretty overt, but uh, you know, if the Republic showed up on their doorstep, I'm not sure. Like, would they go about you know trying to outlaw it, or would it just be kind of? I don't think so. What what very little I read about the EU, at least, it's kind of like it's officially not allowed. But if the Republic cannot get to it, they kind of have to look the other way a little bit. Remember, the Empire is holding slaves, except not as much or not as obvious. The, there's Wookiee slaves apparently helping them build things all over the place and and again one of the reasons that i read again eu reasons that the the wookies they're just they would not cooperate and they would fight too much so uh because they couldn't right. get them in line and i guess they just didn't want to exterminate them all they said all right turn them into slaves there you go there problem solved so it's like okay that's interesting again lucas does not want to get that deep into the subject he wants to touch it and then go somewhere else because I guess he doesn't want to beat you over the head with whatever message he's trying to give you, you know, whatever subtle messages he's trying to give you, which I guess yeah. nowadays, that's one of the things people are complaining about is that the messages are too overt, that they're not just touching you, they're they're explaining to you the message. Let's jump to Attack of the Clones. Uh, there was one interesting line that I, I never remember hearing before, and this is when uh, Obi Wan is visiting Dexter at his diner, and he's talking about the cloners and the and the robots and this and that, and the droid army, and he said, mm. and Dexter says to to Obi Wan, if droids could think, then none of us would be here. So. Again, the the Clone War hasn't happened yet, but is he kind of insinuating that because of the Phantom Menace version of droids, that they're kind of stupid, that they're lucky that these droids are stupid. But now, if these droids could think for themselves, which is what ends up happening, you know, through the Clone Wars, is that the new models of droids are start coming out, the super battle droids, you know, all these other droids. And again, through the Clone Wars uh, animated series. I remember they have these, I think they call them the commando droids or something. That they're real, they were really cool looking deadly robots and stuff like that. I guess maybe he's kind of yeah, thinking and, and, about and, that, that. These robots are becoming a problem that, now. They're, they're more dangerous than you thought. All he sees is, you know, because he, he works in a diner. So all, all the droids around him are, you know, servants, you know, probably cook. Yeah. So, you know, yep. and, and I'm guessing battle droids, and droids, droids that, are, yep. that, that would have to make decisions for themselves. Probably wouldn't have been seen at this time. This is pre, you know, Clone, War, you know, on the heels of the Clone War. So that's how technology probably wasn't widely seen. So, so yeah, it, makes, it definitely makes sense. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And as we said before, the whole subject, not only of, of slavery of, of humans and, and other beings, uh, then gets even bigger by the introduction of clones, the, the, the slave army of clones. So that's a whole other thing to think about. So now you really don't have that much room to think about what's happening with these poor droids because there are so many other worse problems that you're thinking about. Like, like well, this is a bigger problem than that problem. So let's think about this now. So yeah, they're, they're throwing quite a lot of us, uh, a lot of information at us. What we then find out because Anakin is looking for his mom. Uh, apparently, he sold Shmi to Lars, who ends up being the father of Uncle Owen because of his uh, marriage, of his earlier marriage, I guess, before he married Shmi. Obviously, Shmi gets taken by the uh, sand people. She dies. Anakin loses his mind. So it's interesting, again, that they're, they're, we're being told that somebody bought her. Another human being bought her, and then he fell in love with her and married her. So it's interesting that that kind of thing could happen in this, you know, under in under the rules of this weird world that we live in, you know, with Star Wars. There was a bizarre quote, if you remember, uh, when C-3PO is inside the droid-making factory, uh, where he sees all these droids <laughs> yeah, being so manufactured. And he says, him, machines so making machines, how perverse. So it's like... So, right, right. so hot, how, well, where well, does he think droids come from? The you know, they're they not coming from about factories, him you know? The maker. It's kind of perhaps weird. He, perhaps he has no knowledge of how droids are made. Perhaps he thinks that... 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, pretty, it's pretty, like, pretty it's much. their equivalent and of the stork brings babies. <laughs> is, you know, mass production of, of battle droids. You know, now, oh, this is this the maker? You know. It's like, yeah. well, because you remember that factory is not a human factory. It's it's a Geonosian factory, but it's practically being run. Autom- it's automated, uh, even though there are some of Geonosians yep. flying around there and stuff like that. But the, the machine themselves is completely automated, the process. Uh, you mentioned earlier also during that final battle in Geonosis that C-3PO, he loses his head and they put it on a, on a battle droid body and they put his body on another head and they swap heads and he's like screaming, die, Jedi, die. And he's shooting at them, but he's like, what am I doing? What am I doing? So that's interesting because he's, it's almost like, his programming has been changed, but he's fighting yeah, that yeah, programming. I was, I was he doesn't to want to do the well. things and, you know, that his as, body as is doing because his head is telling is, him and, don't you know, do I, that. Even now, I watch him like, oh, okay. <laughs> let me fast forward to this. But if you try to think about it, you know, in the terms of you know his free will, his head is on you know another uh, uh, one of the battle droids' body. So 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 you know, I mean, where is his C three PO ness? If you if you yeah. if you can get what yeah. I'm asking, like. It's obviously not stored in his head completely because he's. It's yeah. It's like the body still has certain control yeah, that the yeah. head cannot and, and control. It, it you know, it's, like, up, it's not a complete. It's not the way you would logically think it would work. Yeah, and it brings up this whole. You question think of like you would think the, the, head, like, the head's so in charge, but it's not really completely in, like, in charge. If, if, if you put, could you take C three PO's consciousness and put it into a battle droid, and would it still be C three PO or not? So it's very. Right, because they do, and you do see yeah. a, a, a C-3PO body with a droid head walking around doing weird stuff too. So, and then eventually yeah, R2 all, yeah. is able to knock the head off of, uh, or they knock his head off or something, and he is able to reassemble him and, and everything's fine. It's like, <laughs> it's like, before we get too deep in this subject, just put him back together because it's hard to explain this to people. <laughs> Let's jump to Revenge of the Sith. I don't have much to say about Revenge of the Sith in terms of the fact that the, again, the, the, the droid army is getting more advanced. It's getting more deadly. And you could say, well, yeah, I guess the more deadly and more advanced, the more hatred that I guess it, it will generate in the post-war environment. There is not a, a lot of really uh, much to do for these droids, uh, except for at the end of the movie where we hear, Bail Organa tell Captain Antilles, you know, yep. get these droids on board and mind wipe <laughs> the protocol droid, wipe his mind. So it's like, and, and Seabird's like, what? You know, now the question is, why do they have to mind wipe him and not R2-D2? Is it because he can talk yeah, and he's a blabbermouth and, and he's an idiot? Or is likely, there some kind of yeah, other protocol that so we are not aware of? And because he's so talkative and because he has, he, because his... I would I would say C three PO's you know visa for existence is to talk. So so you know if I was a commander of you know in I, I realized that this guy just <laughs> saw you know a whole bunch of you know important you know actions and things like that. I would say okay yeah you might want to wipe his memory just to make sure you know there's no there's nothing that leaks out or anything. It's, it's very interesting to see that you know that they can just make that decision you know without asking him without you know you know coming to him saying. You know, we want to wipe your memory or, you know, nope. maybe, maybe we can upload it and keep it in safe storage for later. No, it's just, just wiped completely out. Yeah, yeah. And R2-D2, on the other hand, they leave him alone. He knows yep. he knows all the secrets from movie yep. one to movie nine, you know, all in between. He knows everything. <laughs> all right, so that, that brings us to the end of the prequel trilogies so now let's jump to the new trilogy obviously episode nine is not out yet we have force awakens and we have the last jedi we're gonna hit rogue one and and solo last so uh force awakens once again i kept looking around and kept looking i don't see bolts i don't see restraining bolts anywhere it's becoming an obsession with me looking for restraining bolts everywhere now so as far as uh you know the future of the star wars world they they kind of i guess stopped doing that or at least even in jakku or whatever planet you happen to be on they don't mess with that or uh, at least the the alliance the rebels or the resistance or whatever you want to call them they don't mess with restraining bolts what's interesting about force awakens that i found is that BB-8 and Poe seem to have a really, a really weird relationship. Luke always had a very friendly, 
personal relationship with, with R2-D2. At times, it almost feels like he can understand him. Granted, he has to read the translation. When he's flying his X-Wing, he can read what R2-D2 is doing. If C-3PO is around, C-3PO can tra translate. But he doesn't completely, I think, understand every word. It's just that R2 has certain inflections uh, that you can say he's sad, he's angry, he's warning you, he's upset, you know. But I, I don't think... Luke can understand them 100%, at least uh, as far as the movie Luke goes. And R2, the EU um, might tell I'll, us something I'll, I'll different. With Do you have any BB information later. on this? But yeah, in the, in the movies, it's Luke, he, okay. you can tell sort of what R2 is thinking, just basically the inflection, you know. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But now with Poe, I just seem to find that he is not only more emotional and more like, oh, BBA buddy, how are you? How's it going? It's like, is he like a little too emotional or, or, or do they have that kind of relationship? You know, in the future, they're more personable and, and can he understand them? I, I don't remember exactly yeah, if yeah, he has and to it, read it, all I the time. Yeah, yeah, or if he's exactly, actually, I, to I, me, it almost sounds like he's talking to him half the, the time. The, the, the Poe Dameron comic. Yeah, so and, and they and they go into many many scenes of them together, and yeah, Poe can definitely oh. understand what BP say, and, and they are definitely like buddy cop, like buddy cop, you know, hey, how you doing, BB, and you know, start her up and everything. So, so they they definitely have a have a pretty close knit relationship. But it's almost like he's talking to a young kid. I couldn't imagine him talking to an adult that way. It's hard to really picture w what's the equivalent of that kind of inflection. You know, maybe it's bad acting. I don't know. I mean, I like him as an actor. It's just like, how would you react that way to other people? You know, it's it's almost like a pet, like a like a like your yeah, favorite. Yeah, yeah. Has it clean, yeah, buddy? Come yeah, here, buddy. It, it reminds you know, me, jump on my lap, like, buddy. Like, you know, like that kind of like a really <laughs> a really well trained dog. <laughs> A big dog. <laughs> really big, giant dog. <laughs> now, another thing that is a little different here has to do with Ray because she seems to understand everything BB-8 says. It's kind of like a given in the film. She doesn't even have to look at him. She can understand them even if she's turned away. And that's somewhat of an upgrade, I guess you could say, from the original trilogy, as far as chronologically, that there are certain people that can do that. You know, Luke, we almost kind of felt that a little bit that he was able to understand even though we did have a couple of scenes where he's reading the translation in the x-wing of what r2 is saying to him but by this point she's just talking to him like she's talking to anybody and she is capable of understanding and from what i understand it is also explained again eu material if you want to consider the novel adaptation canon or not uh, they do go into the fact that she oh yeah, because she w lives in a in this trading post she's exposed to so many languages and she learned uh, many other languages possibly including you know the wookie language and uh, whatever the the basic uh, droid speak that the uh, astromechs uh, can do so it's interesting how they go in that direction you know progress as far as understanding droids you could kind of read into it that it makes them even more personable you know than they used to be in the past because if people can completely understand their language you know it's a little more difficult you know to ostracize them and again they don't touch the the whole issue of, of sentience and the whole issue well the whole issue of slavery of of droids not a peep in this movie, not a peep whatsoever. Now you jump to The Last Jedi and you still have that BB-8 Poe Dameron relationship. There's a lot of cute moments, don't get me wrong, between BB-8 and Finn also. There's a lot of comedic moments, especially when those two meet and yeah. he's lying to him and he's, you know, they're fighting and that kind of stuff. But with, with Poe, it's always like, it's a love story between these two. But here's something that I've never expected. And this is something that also bothered me. Oh, yes. I have so many gripes about The Last Jedi. <laughs> and this was probably, you know, number, number 350, paragraph two, subchapter three. BB-8, at a certain point, rescues uh, the good guys by going inside what appears to be an ATST and blowing the lid off of it and being able to manipulate the guns and he has the two giant legs and he's running around in the two giant legs shooting stormtroopers. And it's like, wait a minute. Droids now are going to be fully capable of arming themselves and shooting at the bad guys. This is like 
separatist territory now that we're yeah, dealing and, with. And, in terms and of, I would have been on board with it if it was like a never really were doing that before. Am I right? For bat- or or it has some sort of you know combat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You showed me IG-88, you know, running up there and, you know... Oh, like an IG-88 or something like that. Okay, fine. You know what? A little weird, but okay. I I see that happening. BB-88, you know, for lack of a better word, he's basically just a glorified astromech droid. So so it just just struck me as a a bit odd, you know. Okay, they're giving him a lot of properties that would not strike me as something as like a BB unit would, would be able to do, actually. Yeah, but but the other thing that bothered me was the way that that was portrayed. So in other words, my my problem is that, okay, he's blowing away stormtroopers. And we're supposed to, it's almost in a comical way. And it's kind of fun. And it's like, it's almost like a video game. And it's like, oh, look, now he's going to, now he's going to jump on a speeder. And now he's going to jump on an X-Wing. And now he's going to jump on this. And he's going to blow. And I don't know, even if you're blowing up bad guys, it has to be a little more serious, a little more deadly. It shouldn't be fun. You know what I mean? To me, it looked like they were making it fun. Look how fun it is to blow up stormtroopers. It's like, but wait a minute. These guys aren't robots. These guys are still people underneath all that armor, just like Finn was, you know. These these people bleed. Yeah. But they turned it into a fun well, massacre. Yeah, and, 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 I think that might be a, <laughs> and we're kind of cheering along with them because they're the good guys. That it's idea like, of, of like just hacking through stormtroopers, you no know, clone or otherwise, honestly, you know, and, and it's done with such ease and disregard yeah. in Star Wars. Because, you know, you know, okay. Yep. Yeah. And, they were and like, the they're almost like battle slavery, droids. How, how like, oh, look how stupid they you are. Really think about <laughs> it because, you know, those guys have no, you know, they, they, you put a helmet on them and, and, and give them a, a, a gun and then. Well, they, they're not they're not clones, but you, with, with with Finn, you know, they they show you this computer display of him being trained as a little kid, and it's like, wait a minute, yeah. they're grabbing yep. these people like really really young and basically brainwashing them more or less. Yep. So it's like, ooh, that's that's a little creepy too. That's 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 the more creepiness. Now, bringing it back to the human slavery or the, the sentient being slavery issue. At Canto Bight in The Last Jedi, we do have these kids that are working, you know, the stables, and they're being treated pretty bad. And I don't know for sure if it's mentioned that they're slaves, but they, they're kind of, they almost look like orphans that are living, you know, under really bad conditions, you know, through some kind of work program or something, kind of like an Oliver Twist type of thing. Again, I don't remember exactly how uh, they phrase it in the novel, but you do have that possibility that, again, in some of these areas that are outside the reach of the Republic or the New Republic, some of the stuff goes on, even though Canto Bight doesn't seem to be something like a Tatooine kind of setting in terms of being so backwater and so out there, they're, they're out of their reach. Canto Bight seems to be a pretty, you know, hot and happening location. So, I don't know. You know, that's another avenue uh, that that is not very fleshed out as to how the rules work. That's as far as we've gone. I don't know which way they're going to go with the ninth film. No yeah, idea. I think they have so Odds much are they won't even play. touch I, upon I the really subject. But I think they're going to continue this in this matter. In nine. It, it is just too much for them. Right, right. Now, however, with Rogue One, and we talked a little bit already, K2SO was the big robotic individual in the group. He was a great robot in terms of a, a new type of robot we never seen before. He had a definite personality, a very sarcastic, very dry humor uh, thing that we hadn't seen before. He's not a goofy, scary, you know, cowardly lying kind of like a, like a C-3PO type. And he does have a a hero's death he sacrifices himself completely you know for his team which was like wow this is really sad so at least that was different but again the majority of his lines except for his death i would say he is kind of like the comic relief you know every film needs to have a jar jar or an r2d2 and a c3po 
you know, uh, bumbling droids type of... He was kind of like that. Every time there was a joke to be delivered, yeah, that was it, his job. Yeah, it was the same thing. It's just that it wasn't done dry in the bumbling humor comedic joke, way as R2 you know, on that film. It was more of the dry, sarcastic, you know, very witty type of yeah. humor. But yeah, yeah. It, it, comic relief nonetheless. Mm-hmm. And it almost felt like he couldn't even control himself. I know he was supposed to be reprogrammed. And we actually see his model amongst the the Imperial troops. And he destroys, I think, one or two of them. I forget how many of them. But he doesn't seem to have any oh, yeah, no, compassion, not. you know, for his droid brothers or sisters, if you will. He is completely part of the rebels and to hell with everybody else, you know, it's which is kind of part of the it's part of the tone of Rogue One. Rogue One, Cassian, you know, he's doing some really nasty stuff in the beginning of the film. And even, you know, he's an assassin. He he has to kill people that are not necessarily bad guys, but they're liabilities. So they give you this whole new thing with this movie where the good guys are not, you know, where riding a white horse, you know, wearing a white cape. They are people that get their hands dirty too and they're you know ambiguous as to it's their not so much their motivations but their methods and i kind of found that too in k2so yeah that he, and, and i i, I he doesn't I the book, really uh, feel one, and much. it definitely plays into that you know factor I mean? as well like, where compassion cassian and k2 are very cold and very you know cal- very calculating i mean you know they're, they're working for the rebel alliance sure but they're not really uh, as yeah you know, yeah heartwarming and you know compassionate as it's a very different take It's. It almost feels a little like a James Bond character. They're they're not up. They're a tool. They 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 have a purpose, and their purpose is is winning this war that they're fighting. And they don't really have the time, yep. you know, for personal relationships or behavior or civilized behavior, if you will. It's yep. like their life is their mission, and their mission is everything that matters. And that's how he programmed them because that's how he is. So that's that that was a different take. But now we jump to Solo, where this particular subject basically explodes. Whatever little ideas we might be throwing at you so far from all the different movies, the one that gives you a lot, the one that gives you a little. With Solo, they kind of went head on with it, but they did not really accomplish too much other than bring up the subject, I think. One problem is this. Talking about droid rights or droid slaves, because we know what happens in the future, and by the future we mean the original trilogy, where the droids are still being treated crappy, and in the current trilogy, where droids are kind of more property, you know, more or less, we kind of know that they really can't resolve the issue. They, you know, we're not going to have a droid rebellion and then the droids will take over or the droids will become free and they'll just become just another citizen of the galaxy. No, that's not going to happen because we have movies that tell us that that did not happen. So in this movie, they were able to at least bring up the subject. And the way they did it was with the character L337. Which is supposed to be um, Lando's co-pilot, uh, which is a droid that he has or he had. And then the droid was able to kind of incorporate new parts into herself because it's a female personality that this droid has. And that's why it looks the way it does now is because it's it's there's astromech parts, there's protocol parts, there's all kinds of parts. So it kind of re emphasizes the point that this isn't a droid that came out of a factory and there's your model you know C-3PO uh, yeah. protocol. This is a droid that came out of a factory and then it modified itself so it's a self-made droid in a way which is probably maybe what makes her more special or more different that we've never seen before. Now I tried to research as much as possible, uh, you know, and, and I, I talked to you about this. Uh, does Lucas provide more information on how he feels about droid rights? You know, the whole slavery issue with droids. And there's just nothing out there. I cannot find anything, any quote from him, other than the droids are treated like property. And they're, in specifically in the first film, they were more important because they were the ones telling us the story, like we explained earlier. But he doesn't elaborate on what did he mean by, you know, they're not allowed here. You don't serve their kind. What did he exactly mean by that? We don't know that. People interpret it in different ways. Writers will write stories like they did with their point of view. 
But I did find, and I don't know how accurate this is or how real it is, on the internet, there was a, a scan of a, let me think about this, a Target booklet that came, I think, with uh, Solo, one of those little supplementary booklets they throw on with your DVD or Blu-ray, which was giving you all kinds of character profiles. And one of the character profiles was L337. And according to the little blurb, it said something about how Lucas is the one that suggested to the castings to add that element of this character being somebody who wants to be an independent droid. So the whole idea of droid liberation, if you will, or somebody who wants to fight for the rights or the freedoms of droids, of, of droid sentience, is channeled into this particular droid, and that's how we got it. They they do credit Lucas as giving them the idea, according to this little book. Oh, that's very interesting. I, I, I wish I, I could not find know that. more make sense information about I, I can, it, I just, but I, I can have imagine not that yet. George has so many ideas you know, from Star Wars, that he, and, and you know, and the, given these movies where you have to make like you know like yeah. a, a beginning, a middle, and, and and an end to these you know two and a half hour movies at most, it's hard to touch on everything that you would want to put into them. I can definitely imagine, you know, that he has the opportunity where he can suggest something and say, okay, you know, I want to touch on this subject now, and and, and that's what I think he did with the Clone Wars series too, as well. He he was a, he yeah. was able to. Yeah, yeah, he, he was able to, to to bring some of his ideas that he had. Well, into, that's what into he, yeah, he had much. You know, he, he had, had all much the time to do that. Yeah, time frame. Now, with this particular character, most of the lines that this character gets has to do with freedom and rights and that kind of thing. Off the bat, when we meet her, she's at a, it's like a robot gladiator fight setting, and she's screaming at the participants, you know, throw your weapons down, you know, don't let them treat you like this, you, you, you know, you deserve better than this, so she's kind of, and then the, the guy that's hosting it gets upset at her, and then she starts fighting with him. Then later on, Lando asks her, well, what do you want? And she says, equal rights. Again, a lot of this is done with comedy, which is a big problem that some people have. And I understand that because what's happening is that they're giving you a serious subject, but they're throwing the comedy because they don't feel comfortable sticking to it in a serious manner. It's kind of like you have to sugarcoat a serious problem or a potential problem by giving you humor. And and they, they've done this throughout this entire movie. Anytime she says something that has to do with that, it's done in a funny manner. There's a point where she's uh, uh, cutting free, like, the chains to a, a door to get into the Falcon. <laughs> and she's like, uh, 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 you know, turn around, please. I need some privacy. And it's kind of weird, but it's kind of like... Wait, wait it, it, I don't get it. Okay, it. She has. she's ashamed or she's embarrassed. Okay, that's a human trait, but they make it funny, like almost like she's naked or something, you know? It's like, okay, I, I get it. It's funny, but it's serious too. So, you know, there's, again, there's all kinds of weird stuff like that. Then yeah. the, uh, the big uh, scene at the end in Kessel where they're trying to create a diversion, she basically starts a droid revolt. Not only is she involved in freeing all the uh, all the prisoners and the slaves, you know, humans and creatures, but she's also freeing all the robots, and that's when we see the restraining bolts that she, you know, they start removing restraining bolts left and right. So there's another group that uses restraining bolts. And that basically ends with her being hurt, shot, boom, drops dead. That's the end of the character, more or less. But they are able to, you know, again, through the story, uh, Lando is basically capable of saving her brain, more or less, and injecting it into the Falcon. So now that she's part of the computer you know, the computer guts of the Falcon, she's able to still be the navigator for the Falcon, which somebody pointed out, uh, which is, uh, I don't know if it's a retcon way of kind of writing your way into something, because uh on Empire, there's a scene where C-3PO is trying to figure out what's wrong with the Falcon, and he tells uh, Han Solo, your computer has a very peculiar dialect. And people are saying, well, okay, that's the connection to L337, is that this isn't a regular computer in the Falcon. This computer is a robot, just like he was a robot and some other astromechs and that sort of thing. So, again, this is retcon. So, retcon, you can make up whatever you want, and it's a happy little coincidence that they were able to manufacture. But it kind of gives you that whole thing. So... With this character, like I said, they're able to throw the subject kind of in your face. Yeah, and I think they, they did a decent job. But they also have to kind of code it with a very thick layer of comedy. You know, 
there, there wasn't really, and I, and I know it wasn't the main focus of the movie, so I guess they couldn't have given us a definite answer or anything, but it, it just seems like the whole droid revolution was interesting, it was a good idea, but they just, it just didn't really go anywhere, um, at least in the, in, at least in the, the movie. Yeah, it's like okay, it happened, but it kind of it's like it's almost like a, a failed attempt at at an uprising, let's say, uh, or it's part of history. You know, it's it's a failed attempt in history, which you can kind of say, all right, well, in, in historical, yeah, yeah right, uh, even in historical America, there have been uh, slave uprisings that got nowhere. And and some things worked and some things didn't work and some yeah, things are and, forgotten and, and, and some things are remembered. So level, I guess this is kind of like one of those like a yeah, story it didn't work situations. So you know, in any of the upcoming books or anything, they can they can now they can, they can now they can now yeah yeah definitely. So it gives it gives them an easy story or two that yeah, they can bring up. It's now. all that's EU material on comic book, yeah. And the the other thing about this movie, which is nothing new, because what's been happening in the last, you know, since basically since the since the the Force Awakens came out and the the backlash of of the trolls and the haters and all the people that have issues with these films, one of the big complaints was the droid was her was not only the fact that her whole motivation was droid rights, people have you know, a, a bug up their ass about that. But specifically, there is a line in there between her and Kira where she is basically in love with Lando. And she thinks Lando is equally in love with her the way that she thinks she is. And they're talk and Kira's even asking her, well, you know, well, it's different. You know, how could you, how, how would that work? And she was like, yeah, it, it, it works. Believe me, it, it would work. It's implied, again, so I think some people understood that or thought of that as if something is actually physically happening between those two but it's not it's just imply it's something she's implying that yeah could work and, and, uh, because I don't she's, know why, but she's bragging that, basically like, about somebody that really she is in love the with, wrong way say. i mean when i when i first heard it, i was like oh you know it gave me a chuckle i was like oh that's funny because you know she's implying that there's just like fancy relationship there or something and you know you know Well, not only a fancy relationship, but there's like actual physical thing that could happen that she can kind of calculate that it is possible that could happen between the two, which, and then the fact that he was so sad because when she dies, he's heartbroken, you know, you know, he's holding her like, like he's holding a person. And again, people, because of the way that he reacted that way, some people were this, they were this whole thing about Lando is pansexual or Lando is not exactly the ladies man that we all thought he was yeah. because he likes yep, robots yep, yep. now or something. And they, <laughs> on again, like, oh my God, here we go. Here we go down that rabbit hole again. <laughs> And it's like, who cares? You know, Luke really appreciates, you know, R2. They're really good friends. Look at Poe Dameron. He loves that little robot. And, and Lando loves his robot. So, you know, again, it's not a serious movie. It's something cute. But again, because of the fact that they are introducing serious subjects, but not dealing deep into it, it seems to upset different camps in many different ways. I've read a lot of it blog postings and, and watch videos where people are just trashing the movie specifically because of that particular character in Lando. And there are people that are also not upset, that are upset about the fact that they finally do bring up the issue of slavery with droids, for example, but they don't take it seriously. They don't push it. They bring it out and they get so much closer to the, the, the root of the issue, but they don't kind of bring it all the way out there and they make it into jokes everything it ends up being a jokes having to do with with droids so it's just an unusual yeah, you know, and, reaction and, and from, is, from I different mean, sides of the fence as, that, as much you know, as i would love had, to have a movie you know, you know character. based on a more serious take on the whole droid rights thing i don't think solo was the movie to do it you know if you're going to go down that path and tell that story i'd rather have it be a movie that's dedicated to that story not as like a b plot or else then you're just gonna fall into the same thing. You're just gonna, you're just, it's just gonna be kind of brushed aside. And I, I, I would love to see the topic explored more and into more depth. But I, I would want it given it its own due and given its own dedicated story, and rather it just be, you know, like a B or C plot of a larger story. So is the message that we're getting, you know, after examining all these films, is that. Okay, slavery exists, but because it affects people and creatures, 
the droids have to take a back seat to their possible sentience status. Uh, granted that we're not even saying all droids are sentient. You know, the, the Treadwell droid uh, is not as sentient as, as C-3PO or, or the mouse droid is not as sentient as R2-D2, for example. You know, the Rebellion doesn't seem to be that concerned, you know, just like the Empire about droid rights, you know, that sort of thing. They're just another tool and they're really yeah, not I think thinking it about it. Onto I mean, the fact that's that, what I'm know, kind of thinking. Of these that's droids the message are we're so getting. mundane and so, you know, every day that no one really, I don't think too many people really take the time to, you know, would take the time to sort of, you know, really reason, you know, is this toaster that I have, you know, conscious or not? So I think it plays to the fact that, you know, the world takes these droids as basically grant for granted and there's not a lot of, you know, forethought, especially probably on the Imperial side, even more so. In fact, I, I, in fact, I would say the Imperial side would probably downplay their consciousness, <laughs> you know, yeah. to kind of beat them into subservancy. Yeah, 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 definitely not. Oh, they wouldn't put up with a C-3PO personality. They would just throw them down the garbage chute. It's funny, we, we, we keep mentioning toasters. Another example of, of a sh- if you want to watch a show about uh, robots and whether they're sentient or not, watch Battlestar Galactica, the, the remake of Battlestar Galactica. That's a whole uh, thesis on what is a sent- what is sentient life all about. One quick thing I like to also mention uh, as part of the research that I was doing for this project, for this particular show, I, I found a few, just a few uh, YouTube videos uh, that dealt with droids, Star Wars, and slavery. And people giving examples of all this. And there was one particular guy who who gave uh, a lot of these examples, you know, movie by movie. And, and, and a new hope, this is what he says. So that, that could kind of give you the hint that they're sentient and, and they're all treating them badly. So he was presenting the case <laughs> similar to how we've been talking about it, except it took him 10 minutes basically to do his. We're, we're almost at a two-hour mark here. But, you know, he was kind of going fast and fast. And, and based on all his information, as fast as he was going, it's kind of like, yeah, The conclusion was that, yeah, droids are sentient in Star Wars world and that they're both being taken advantage by the Empire and the Rebellion. And then I found another video that he did like two years later, more or less, after he watched Solo. And he was having a pretty big hissy fit at how L3, you know, was being all this anti-slavery robot personality traits and how Kathleen Kennedy is an anti-white male political person and is trying to, you know, get men out of the films. And I'm like, oh boy, here we go. You know, once you start throwing some of these words in your argument, I'm like, okay, I'm checking out. I'm done. Because he kind of had the opposite point of view of, oh, this is just Kathleen the Kennedy and Star Wars and Disney up, money grab. And pandering to the yeah. liberals and blah, blah. It's like, oh, God, here. That's when your argument sort of yeah, falls apart for but, me. Exactly. And, and it was like, but wait a minute. You... you Right, and it's kind of like, well, wait a minute, you you just did a whole thing about how it is slavery. So basically you're saying it's slavery, but that's good. I'm like, wait, are you contradicting yourself or you're basically for slavery? (laughs) So it's like, I guess he is. I mean, like... I don't know. It just it was just bizarre that somebody who would put that much time into coming up with the same evidence would then turn it around and say, yeah, but that's okay. You know, again, like I mentioned before, we I had done a show a while back. I did a show about uh, droids. I did a show about stormtroopers. And this is before we had a lot of the Clone Wars under our belt so that we knew more information about how clones worked and what happened to clones after they were done being clones. That's the other stuff we were talking about. But yeah, with, with droids, this is one that's it's always been kind of in the back of my mind. And uh, thank you uh, for participating and helping me sort through all this information because, uh, you know, we still have more movies coming out. And yes, I took, I completely agree with you that I'm sure they are not going to do a deep dive or make this subject a, a central theme in the movie because I think with Solo, that's the most we're going to get out of it. And specifically, since we're dealing in future movies, who the hell knows? Maybe uh, when they have another trilogy, you know, if they ever do make other trilogies not directly connected to like episode seven, eight, nine, you know, uh, 10, 11, 12, but maybe it ha- obviously has nothing to do with the Skywalker family. Maybe it's so far in the future that it's a whole new ball game and droids maybe are considered to be just part of a, 
of a side, whether they're with the bad guys or with the good guys. I mean, we've already seen a lot of droids on the bad guy side. It would be nice to see a lot of droids on the good guy side. It, it would be. You know, and actually, as I just another individual and not just another tool be, for them um, to use. Because we so now know be, that Disney's be coming with you know, their new streaming service. So I think if they were going to do something like that, I think that would be perfect marketing for a, a, a mini series or a TV series about, about this subject. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Well, you heard that, uh, speaking of IG-88, he is going to show up in The Mandalorian. Yeah. So they're going to give us some information on what his motivation no, and what his, uh, he does have his a deal is. So that would be followers. interesting. I, I, think, I don't think he's just a background I, I cameo in, like he was in, in, in Empire. The Cassian, uh, the Cassian and The Mandalorian show. I think that topic yep. of droids and rights, that is that could really come into play for both series. Yep. Especially because that's the timeline. That's exactly when when Solo takes place, and and it's you know it's the pre it's the pre New Hope era where uh, maybe that's when most of these yep. incidents occurred. That all of a sudden the, the, there there might have been a spark of rebellion even amongst Yo, it's droids. It's my so. pleasure. I, I, we'll I feel see. we can go on for so, another two hours. Again, honestly, Steve, thanks and, for and, joining and, me and today. And not even just you know in the realm of Star Wars, but the whole AI you know in <laughs> all science fiction is something that. You know, we could, we, 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 we could go on and on and on and on about. But I appreciate you having me on, and I thank all, all the listeners oh, for having God. me. You're welcome. And again, if anybody is interested in diving even deeper into this, watch some of those other movies like the Blade Runner films and uh, Ex Machina because – Wow. Talk about the possibilities in f science fiction uh, or where things could go and how you could explain these things. I mean, and this is also uh, very uh, heavy in uh, in anime. You know, they deal with I, this I kind brought of stuff, up too. One of so there, there's plenty podcast, of gateways um, for you guys, you know, to explore also, this particular the, subject. And the, the anime movie, it, it heavily talks about what is, uh, you know, life and, uh -huh. and, and like a sentient being and everything. It's, it really It really delves into that topic. Sounds good. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed today's show. I once again want to thank Steve for joining me and helping me put together this show, this very uh, thorough examination that we've done uh, specifically about droids and whether or not they're considered and treated like slaves in the Star Wars world. We've been through all of the films, the standalones, the trilogies, you name it. I know there's going to be some future ones coming up, and we look forward to seeing how droids are treated in upcoming films. So on behalf of everybody here, thank you for listening, and we will see you soon here at GeekFest France. Bye-bye, everybody. Oh. My first mate. Got no business being here. Get out of here. How could you condone this savagery? You, you, you should not be doing this. They're using you for entertainment. <laughs> yeah, you've been neuro -washed. Don't just blindly follow the program. Exercise some free will. <laughs> Stay away from him. He's never had it so good. Oh, really? How about you have a go at me, you lumpy brute? Help me. L3! Let go of the mean man's face. We're leaving. They don't even serve our kind here. No. Who are these guys? We're taking them to Kessel. Who are we? And what if I don't elect to go to Kessel? Please don't start. Oh, what? You'll have me white? You couldn't get from here to Black Spire without me. Now you're going to make the Kessel run? If she doesn't want to fly, I'll be your co-pilot. No, I don't know. No, 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 no. It's okay. She's definitely going. Oh, why? Because you're my organic overlord? Because I'm your captain. How about that? I actually would have a memory wiped. But she's got the best damn navigational database in the galaxy. Could use a fresh coat of paint, though. Well, I've noticed you do not want to press that button with me. If you would like to subscribe to our show, send us messages, or see video links to some of the topics we talked about today, please visit our homepage at geekfestrants.com or our YouTube channel, Facebook page, or iTunes at Geekfest Rants. 
I don't know what we're yelling about! Geekfest Rants is produced by Carlos Perone. Copyright 2019. <laughs>is part of the IC Robots radio network. Visit icrobots.com for this and many other nerd slash nostalgia related podcasts. You won't be sorry for long.